Alright, so I'm finally back. Got this thing on me. And I was actually planning to finally get into chess today. And also play some catch up. Cause oh my god, I have a shit ton of videos to catch up to. A backlog of about 20 videos daily. All of that, there's just so many events happening around the globe that is just. What will we really do? Just a question here. From people screaming about the economy to in the next new game that is probably going to end up in the dead zone, you would just be surprised. Regardless, let's get this little bit of setup out of the way and actually continue. Okay, maybe actually maybe better to go for a general window then. Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about... Since this is not the main focus, this will definitely be given a smaller screen, but... Let's see where I can center this then. Okay, that's the best centering then. Let's continue. All of the backrooms, creatures, and entities that I've ever gone over on the channel. This video is a huge compilation of the creature explanations that I uploaded last year. And some of them I took down from YouTube, but they're making an appearance again. But I haven't uploaded just a backrooms creatures video in like six months, and I hardly ever upload videos longer than an hour. Thank you for watching. Let's get into a relaxing hour. 
The fact is that I'm actually going to have to end up playing rapidly while also speaking simultaneously. This is gonna actually going to be a slight challenge for me, which is a first. ...of Backroom's creatures. Enjoy. First up for the video, we have a creature called a Combine or a Combine. These are creatures made up of different parts of other things, and specifically human parts. Thus the name Combine, because you Especially combine things. Well, they kind of look like a flesh-colored centipede, which is nasty as it is, about and they've got human idiot. hair running down their back. Their legs are double-jointed and can contort in weird ways, and they kind of resemble the shape of human fingers, except at the very end of them, they're these chitin or chitin. If you played Ark Survival, you know what I'm talking about. Tips. These tips work as like photoreceptors, kind of like a nose, so they use them to sniff out their surroundings. Combines don't actually have a designated head per se, they're kind of just one whole thing. These little finger legs can actually expand into an extra digestive pouch, so ew. These creatures can also detach specific segments of themselves if one part gets too damaged, kind of like a lizard with its tail. These centipedes typically live in areas with low classifications like class 0 or class 1, and they don't normally attack other creatures or wanderers for the most part they're just scavengers that eat mold or rotten food that's been left behind and they drink from random almond water puddles they have been recorded on several occasions though attacking sleeping wanderers so just don't sleep where you're an easy target i'm pretty sure that's a given in the back rooms if a combined senses danger or is actually under attack they will detach up to six legs from its main body and they'll start wriggling around in a sort of distraction way nice and if the entire thing is actually sustaining heavy damage the body will split itself into three different parts two of those parts will become normal healthy combines and the third part will just be that injured part and it will probably die the closest thing in real life that a combine is compared to would be a mollusk like a snail or a clam because the entire body of this thing operates under some sort of like superficial connection between different mollusk like creatures and not one big creature. So the legs and the sections of the body are actually different creatures that make up the one thing. It's not just one big centipede, it's like 10 different mollusks that come together. Just like real life snails, they bleed blue blood, but one thing that separates them from real life mollusks is that these creatures have skeletal structures. Also, they breed by sprouting newborns through their legs, okay some colonies have actually tamed these creatures as a sort of dog replacement which is, i thought that was pretty funny nothing like a giant centipede with human hair and fingers the next entity is called the key master this entity is a paranormal type being that takes on the appearance of a normal human sort of he wears a victorian era leather coat and his collar is really tall and it obscures the bottom half of his face so the visible part of his face is very pale and his eyes are a greenish color. The most notable feature about the Keymaster though is, well, his keys. He wears this huge ring of keys on his hip, kind of like those big rings of keys that janitors wear. And that's pretty much all that's known about the Keymaster. He's a mysterious guy, I kind of like it. A black mist covers a few inches above the ground behind him when he walks, so he could be floating, but no one can tell because you can't see his feet. The Keymaster is actually pretty antisocial, and he kind of just floats around in a confused state. But when he does interact with wanderers, he's pretty neutral. He's not aggressive. And if you kindly approach him and ask him for a key, he'll be willing to give you one, but only one. That's his rule. He doesn't believe in do-overs or second chances. And he says, quote, he isn't liable for any unwanted outcomes. Nice. Also, if you try to attack him, he'll fight back without a second thought. So just don't do that. Also, don't try to ask him any personal questions because he'll just dance around him and not actually answer him. When the Keymaster walks through the back rooms, the entities that he encounters seem to revere him in a way. They look really intimidated just by his presence, so that's kind of cool. Even though the Keymaster sort of looks like a human, he really isn't. He can't actually be harmed at all. He can also face through matter and no clip at will to the floor or ceiling walls seemingly with ease also he can teleport within a hundred foot radius so that's pretty cool in fact the wiki dot says he's a master at teleporting which is so dope the keys on his hip are actually level keys but he can't control which key he gets so he has the power to just randomly generate keys but he can't choose which key he generates it just seems to be random at every time and no one knows how he does this regeneration of keys some think it's some sort of nanotech technology and some people think it's some sort of molecular manipulation sometimes he can generate things that aren't even keys and these things can be anything from entities to objects 
That's why he's considered dangerous since he's unpredictable. So he's a dude who can go anywhere, teleport, manifest level keys and other entities, and floats around with a black mist following him. That's pretty cool. There's a lot of theories on who the Keymaster actually is, and some people think he was a wanderer at some point that got transformed into this key master entity. Some people think he was an experiment that just escaped from a more powerful being. This theory kind of makes sense because he can't generate what he wants. It's just random. And that would lead to the logical explanation of him still being an experiment. Well, I lost. <laughs> but it was my first game in a while. So let's actually figure out what happened here and see where I was trash at. Experiment and not a full on master of level keys. Some people also believe that his power comes from the cloak he wears and not from himself. And when he dies, the coat just finds another host. That's kind of lame though. And the final theory is that he's just a force of nature that's always existed and he can transcend the back rooms and all natural law. I think that's my favorite theory. This dude was super dope though. Next up is a really cool entity. <laughs> is a sentient and self-aware liquid that has a vast knowledge of the back rooms. It takes on the appearance of basic water until it's actually consumed, and then whoever drinks it will start to hear random voices in their head and be filled with these random emotional outbursts at the same time. So the main theory is that the water has the entity's consciousness in it, as well as other people who have consumed the water's consciousness. So this somehow connects you mentally to everyone who's had it and the entity itself. These connections yes. aren't necessarily dangerous, but they can obviously be overwhelming emotions and some psychological damage. So just play it safe but and don't drink it. First there was game, actually an experiment what happened. where someone drank the water and then the water was moved and the person who drank the water could describe exactly so where the, the first... water was moved to in immense detail. So, that's so cool. first few the moves, itself is actually pretty neutral though. Like I actually drink the water and it won't jump if you do it two spaces he will start to communicate with you and it will share his knowledge one. of the back rooms and his knowledge of the other hosts it can also fully control your mind if it wanted to but it doesn't seem to show any interest in doing this so that's good but it's best to just avoid the water unless you're sure it's almond water because even though the entity doesn't want to hurt you it still can so it's just best to play it safe nice. <laughs> Next is a group of creatures called the Bone Thieves. These are huge I actually did not look into the book moves. Yellow skin. It's impervious to he must have studied. Nice. These blob -like it's possible that he may have studied. Stationary for the most part. thing is, I'm actually more, more of a streeter when it comes to or board games. Well, they literally just make you boneless. Like, instantly. The leading theory about how they can mimic things so well is that they have an extremely developed larynx and, and on by extension a cyber shooter. Things sound like and they can instantly and exactly replicate those sounds. But it's completely unknown how you become boneless in the presence of a bone thief. And Which it's also actually gives us pretty nice balance. But whatever happens, it occurs really quick and really clean. It's totally not creepy at all. The good news is their ability to steal your bones can only be done one at a time. So if you're in a big group of people, he can't just instantly do all those people. He has to do one at a time. Their mouths open extremely wide to reveal eyes inside their mouth. What? They have the eyes inside the mouth? And there are two holes on the side of his head where normal eyes would be. These holes emit some kind of bluish liquid that goes all over the body to keep it moist. Their mouths actually don't have teeth or gums, just a void with two white eyes. Nice. When the thief debones whatever prey is going after, it will extend its neck. Going by Sacred Street Outage. After they do this, I would they'll say that their this mouths, is and they won't eat again well, for a week. Obviously so pretty common. For what happens to your bones when they disappear is that they're either totally and I got caught easily by it. Or they're teleported <laughs> to a different level. Literally, you'll just be standing there and go limp because your bones will be gone. And the outside of your body won't even show But I want to analyze every move. You'll just fall down and won't so be able to that move. way, That's I actually learned something. Bone thief, just don't but I know there will definitely be cues in this. Let's see if I actually notice it or not. As long as you take these precautions, you should still be able to keep your bones. The next creature is a species of plants yeah. called the Snatcher. They actually these even say and highlight what mistakes I actually made. Interesting. And when they 
do fully extend themselves, they can reach anywhere from 5 to 7 feet, which is terrifying. This makes it literally impossible to completely dodge an attack. You can only move slightly. You won't be able to get out of the way fast enough. The weeds themselves have been described as extremely sticky. Just kind because of it's actually in set, some rare cases, they can it gives a certain amount of moves then. It causes similar effects to those of liquid pain, so that's nice. Which makes These sense given how heavily research and, and how much AI is in the chest. With their ability to extend 7 feet for an attack, and their ability to emit a liquid pain toxin, you've got yourself a really dangerous plant on your hands. When a Snatcher Weed does attack, the victim can suffer anything from small cuts to total dismemberment. The stems on these weeds have thorns that vary in size from small to large, and if you cut a Snatcher Weed from its stem, you can actually use the weeds as a sword because they immediately come hard and stiff when you cut them off. It's pretty cool. These weeds only grow on levels that are- Let's try this move, we're trying it are above 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can't seem to be grown like a normal plant. Like you can't just pick up a seed and plant it somewhere else and expect it to grow. Although, an entity called the Cultivator has had the ability to grow Snatcher Weeds using a vial of his own tears as fertilizer. Okay. The only success that Megas okay, had let's in double this then. Weeds was when they planted them and then sprinkled the dirt above them with liquid paint. Snatcher weeds will also do anything. There's a lot of inaccuracies, aren't there? Here, so just don't even approach them. It's pretty simple. A wholesome fact is that these natural weeds don't even seem to attack children. So if you're a kid, you're good. So these things are red weeds with spikes that can emit a pain. You defend the pain? Side effects like liquid pain, <sighs> cut you, strangle you, and they can be used as a sword if you cut them down right. That sounds pretty dope to me. It sounds like a good move, but next up is the skin givers. I don't want to do take exactly out the queen immediately. Basically they're the opposite. Because the queen is obviously important. They have an ability to cause extra and excess layers. So I do want to take it upon it instead. The skin will continue even though I may end up losing the piece. But I can but in the strategy I would actually go and attempt to make moves to upgrade the other pawns afterwards to make queens. I would actually go for rooks too, and bishops, if I was going to be very strategy specific, but obviously queens are the best. Alright, next one. That was a free. And that's where it's excess skin, like layers and layers of skin come from their hands. They move extremely slow, which is good, because the weight of the skin on their hands actually weighs them down. If you encounter a skin giver, just avoid any physical contact with them, and you should be fine. Or you can do the almond water trick if you do get touched. That's really creepy though, being encased by a constantly growing skin <sighs> cocoon, like, that's creepy. What if I actually move Next up is a kingdom. and impossible. Hmm. AKA Interesting. XXX. These are shape shifting entities that have infiltrated communities and out. Most all of the backrooms recently. Yeah, this is a really recent one. Specifically, they've been invading the Meg outpost. Okay. On level 1 and level 11. The true form so, of the I can actually try diagonal squares. Most of the time, though, they crafted rig. But there have been some rare cases where they tried to form into and see if I can go from there. Very, very but this is one move I hit. And really hard to identify. But the only way you can catch and at minimum, is by noticing that I would no say you want to at least start That's the only telltale at sign. If there's 10 no moves ahead, or bad odor coming off of them. and, and also one move ahead is definitely the beginning of that one. To them, like this gut feeling that they knew this thing wasn't real or something wasn't right. So if you couple that with no odor coming off of them, you probably got But an there's eventually an amount of moves where it becomes more game probability rather than here's how many moves you have to go for. What? The first known encounter with an imposter was when a random wanderer I would say after maybe 30 moves he was spotted changing form inside of a and bathroom. that grows exponentially so he ran to level 9.1 where he was killed by an entity after this there have been multiple similar occurrences on this level level 1 and then level 11 that's creepy though you wouldn't even know who to trust dude that's actually terrifying and last for today's video is a pretty weird and unique one. They're called Constructors, and that was the name that they gave themselves when they introduced themselves when they randomly appeared on level 11 without warning. 
They disappeared three days after oh. they appeared and have not been seen since. They and then the queen, small, which was a massive mistake. Did, when the queen appeared there, that's when I knew it was, I was starting to lose there. If I could have moved two of my bishops, I could have actually set up a defense there. But as for how, is unknown. But this isn't confirmed because no existence of Vermont McLean and Sons Construction Company has been found to exist. They even handed out business cards to people on level 11, but these cards were completely blank except the company name was scripted. And I made some surprise apologize and questioning of the rules, for sure. Printers were broken. Okay? When they were asked about why they came to but level 11 specifically, I'll say that's standard for now and move on. They hand out consumer satisfaction surveys. What? They ended up giving these surveys to a ton of people. They identified themselves at as Dakota, Rotom, and Beam at Beam to return. And they claimed they were here to hand out those surveys for their company. Nice. Like, that's all they gave. That's all the info they gave to people. Okay, so three gnomes appear out of nowhere with suits and golden hats. And they claim to work for a construction company that doesn't even exist. Good stuff. And then they disappear. I've got doll faces. Now, I did just make a short about this entity. So I won't go into too much detail. Okay. But basically, a doll face looks like a so rag. So guy overlooked the line here? And it has stringy yellow hair. And a plus what military body. construction so, did I miss out on? They're tame, especially if they're in a pack. Because if they are, they'll just gang up on you. So if you do want to tame one, you have to go up to one, a singular doll face. And what single piece moves can take out a group? And offer it to it and be nice to it. And then it'll be tamed and it'll follow you around. It'll literally follow you around forever, and you can do this to literally as many doll faces as you want. Like I said, you could end up with an entire pack just surrounding you. Just make sure you have enough almond water to feed them all, and you should be pretty cool. Okay, so let's start with Next this another popular entity knights. Let's start the knights. And it's faceless. Now, I could fair, actually start to move my bishops. The bishops are just inside really are and didn't miss them. But, when they become adult faces, but they after the bishops, I could have moved my rooks. But he may have ended up saying, he may have like, given his skill level already, he may yeah, have ended up moving like adult his bishops back in response and maybe even a rook. I won't say two rooks, but just a rook. And the friendliest ones are on level 11, where you can literally become friends with them, and build a relationship with them. I would say, the next entity is one that if I, I moved that my bishop one square, diagonal, and it's to the right, Aiden, diagonal Aiden, right Aiden. one up, now, Aiden looks like and a guard that wears a the right bishop, outfit, diagonal right two up, head. after the pawn so, goes up the one, is really smart, and apparently it knows a ton then, and he'll where would he move his knights, and where would he move his bishops, and where would he move his rooks? Because I would want to keep him in that position in order to construct the defense there, so that I can actually have some sort of dispensers for system where I can take them out. But where the opening will be led, I would say would be with the rooks being moved, since they stay at the bottom. But I need to take like, on the middle. Traps. So to me, I mean, he sounds like a pretty. Trying to leave a single opening. Hmm. Now these next two creatures are both. It sounds good, but how does it work in practice? And they're actually pretty similar. One of them is the hermit, who I just. How does it work on the ground? But pretty much, he's a plague doctor that hunts entities. He's really mm. hospitable to people, and he always asks them. Because right now, I feel like it's trash. Always very kind and willing to help. But I also feel like it's also the good. Is like Theodore good trash. Kinsley, and he's a Scottish guy with a huge mustache. Let's continue. He wears a suit and has a ring on his left middle finger. And he's also very friendly and hospitable. And he loves to invite people over to his place. Main mistake here, moving up to Pond. And to tell stories of his own. But sometimes he will ask you, the Wanderer, to tell That's interesting. Stories. Once he builds a relationship with you that's positive, he will protect you well, as most well as else he's built a relationship with. And about 70% of my pieces are missing by now, nice to compared to him having more pieces over me. Not nice to him, so... And he holds massive grudges and refuses to acknowledge, talk to, or help anyone who is rude to him. But yeah, other than this, Theodore and the Plague But then he made a mistake similar. moving upon both cool oh. bounty hunter type things that are nice. But what move did I make afterwards? Because I could have made a mistake afterwards. 
so it could have been mistakes that but I have to stress the fact that it's only the it male It looks boss, like it could have been a mistake stack. Not the female ones because they're really hostile and they can spit acid. The guy ones are pretty harmless and are smaller and they can but be- then you defended it after it's my mistake like stack. Phases, you can tame as many male death moths as you want and you can even have your own army if you really wanted to. And then so I lost a queen after that. Is an entity from level 117 named Mr. Freeman. Now, Mr. Freeman and then like an got a mid move, man with sunglasses and a suit on, and he which I'm only focusing on single piece right now, but I really want to be looking at the entire field, to listen to his lecture, and the entire no board at that. That he's literally just teaching his class to an empty room. Mr. Freeman also is very helpful if you ask questions. He's pretty knowledgeable about the back rooms, especially level 117. Three piece. And he has never showed any signs of aggression Three piece. or anything like that. So he's just an old math teacher. And pen. To teach an empty classroom. Kind of sad, but at least he's nice. And not this guy. Rook. So many of you hate when I do that, but it's so funny. And safety. Alright. So this, entity, this is like where I, said, is I actually had a good setup here, where I move and move a rook. It's called he, Pinhead because he could have, sort of resembles the they could have easily head. taken out my rook. It's believed but that there is only actually this is definitely was to protect the king. Project itself to different places. I also had to bishop like right here, then move him at all, can only appear on so that if he does take the horse, the knight, the knight, and so on. And even then, then it's just a 16.75. I would effectively weed out the queen, and because and there's no upgraded pieces, then I actually could have changed my fate here. To you when you fall but on the alas, destiny happened, and but only the floor. And when it does appear to you, this up, pong, dream, which pong, you can control, this up, where your character and then king, is moving, trying and to take out the dream, you bishop. And the only way to stop this dream is by falling asleep in the dream. More on that later. Pinhead somehow transports you to a reality in this lucid dream. And this reality is your house from real life. It's literally like a live video feed of reality. You can see everyone in your own life that's just going about their daily lives at home and outside. But they can't see you because you're just invisible. You can't interact with any objects. You just float around. But it is confirmed that the reality you see is the real world. You're actually there, you're just invisible to everybody, and Pinhead sent you here. Now this feeling of being trapped back in the quote-unquote real world is really addicting to some people because it's reality, and they try to and stay the game in the stream forever. Which is just what Pinhead wants. Ooh, that was... The so much that their real Yikes. body that's in the back room but it was dreaming, actually better than I expected so for the first time because they're asleep so your body itself after can years wither away and you can unalive from starvation let's Inside start a new game itself, pinhead walks around and torments you the entire time you're in reality he insults you and he says stuff like you've always been invisible you're so far away they don't even miss you and other lame things like that Pinhead also will try to jump scare you and scare you and talk you out of falling asleep in the dream, which is how you exit that dream. So every time you're about to fall asleep, Pinhead will try to jump in front of you or wake you up some way. You just have to ignore him to go back to normal sleep. There's been two instances where Pinhead has physically been in the back rooms with people, and those two people are no longer with us. Both of them were eaten by Pinhead, and all that was left was their heads. It's thought that those two people stayed in their fake dream that was reality for too long, and they ended up being too weak to escape Pinhead's attack in real life. So two out of eight total encounters with Pinhead have ended in unaliving, while the other six have lived through it, but each of them have certain mental issues from seeing reality but not being able to interact with it, or seeing someone they love, and not being able to talk to them. So Pinhead's entire twisted goal is to appear in your head right as you fall asleep on an odd numbered level. If he appears to you in your head, he'll make you dream about the real world. This dream isn't really a dream because it's real. 
he literally sends you to reality just as an invisible person. And the entire time you're there, he keeps trying to scare you and make your stay longer so your real body in the back rooms will weaken enough for him to teleport out of the dream and then attack you. You would be too weak to fight back. That's absolutely terrifying. The six survivors say that they left the dream by finding a room in their house with lots of windows inside and sleeping in it. Apparently, Ben Head doesn't like bright lights. And when they fell asleep in the dream, they were sent back to normal sleeping, which they then woke woke from on the level they went to sleep on. And apparently, Pinhead will not attack if you aren't deteriorating enough. So if you manage to wake up, you won't attack. And this might be or not strong enough to run a live and healthy person. No one knows the real reason. All that's known is that you can God, what deteriorated and malnourished. Staying in the dream for too long. Also, you should definitely avoid sleeping on the floor of any odd number level because you got a 16. trying to keep you there. It takes a lot of mental willpower to to be able to fall asleep. Oh what the actual fuck drift back into normal sleep, which is why Pinhead himself will try to scare you so much. Oh what the actual fuck was that? So now I'm gonna summarize Pinhead in as simple terms as possible. I do not like that as I do not like that at all. No. 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 This is freaking creepy. To attack. This is fucking creepy. On to the next entity. Hey, he's right there! No! No, I am not seeing that! Sexist question mark? They use their huge tongue to attack them, and their tongue's actually really sticky. Oh my god, I am glad I'm playing music. So it kind of traps the prey. As far as interactions with humans go, the Kira is actually pretty harmless. They fly away from most things that are bigger than them, and their wings are literally almost useless because of how small they are. So they just flap them insanely fast to just stay floating. They spend days at a time in a dormant state where they kind of just float in one spot using their float sack. <laughs> and they instantly wake up when they sense a threat getting closer or if they sense a male death moth. Now death moths will go up to these things because they're attracted to the cure bitter's tongue, which is sticking out almost constantly because it's bioluminescent, which means it glows. So the cure bitter's tongue glows and the death moths come up to it because they're dumb. Nice. When the cure bitter senses this, it'll coat the death moth with a sticky saliva and then eat it. But they only eat the male ones, not females. Like I said earlier, these things pose literally no threat to humans. Unless you try to trap one and then they'll get angry and hostile and try to attack you, they still won't do that much damage though. They're so slow that they don't even pose a threat to anyone, honestly. Now I'm gonna read this excerpt from the wiki dot to explain just how this creature looks. Normally I wouldn't do this, but this excerpt isn't even that cringe, so I'm just gonna read it. Perhaps the most striking feature of a cure bitter bird is the bioluminescent gel which it stores in the hump on its back. Despite the fact that this Am am I really Am I really watching this deep into... Am I really watching this later at night? I don't know, maybe that just seems a bit... Uh, uncanny? I mean, I'm, at least I got idiot too, but... <laughs> just a new game? New game? Because... Holy fuck, that was creepy. That was fucking creepy. It's 
gel is a semi-solid. It is significantly lighter than air, allowing this strange creature to stay airborne almost indefinitely. This substance, which I will henceforth refer to as cure bitter gel for simplicity's sake, has an incredible potential for practical uses. When extracted from the cure bitter bird, the gel will maintain its light-giving properties for up to several days. This window of usefulness can be extended almost indefinitely when the gel is exposed to a significant amount of heat. This means that a jar of cure bitter gel could serve as a constant light source in warmer levels in the back rooms. At the moment, me and my colleagues are attempting to find other practical applications for the cure bitter gel. We believe that the properties that allow it to float on air could be incredibly useful in a wide swath of technologies. I have personally ruled out the possibility for it to be used in food stuff. As the gel has an incredibly acrid flavor and is much too acidic and safe to swallow. If you find yourself near a cure bitter bird, make sure you just have a ranged weapon to ward it off and don't grab the tongue because it's really nasty and sticky. The sticky tongue doesn't even pose that much of a threat, it's just nasty and it makes a mess. Also, if you trap one of these things and bring it into the biological research team of the Backrooms Research Consortium, you get a small reward. The next creature is called a Volpe, I think. I don't think it's Volpe, I think it's Volpe, which is actually the Corsican word for fox. They live on foresty levels like level 135 and level 118 and at a quick glance it kind of just looks like a normal fox but when you get a closer look you'll definitely be able to see it's not it's got this insanely cartoonish stretched out snout and you'll see that it actually has two tails these creatures are extremely hostile towards wanderers and they'll try to eat you if they even see you. It's thought that it's actually possible to tame one of these things and own it as a pet, but it's never been tried. Volpes actually burrow into dens in the ground, just like foxes do in real life. However, these things actually booby trap their dens. Yes, I just said that. These Volpes booby trap their dens. They put piles of sticks near the entrance of the hole, so if an intruder comes in, they'll hear the twig snapping, and they'll be able to react. And all their tunnels are really convoluted and intertwining and really, really confusing. They've been observed actually collapsing tunnels behind them if they're being chased through them. So they like kick the side of the wall and the dirt falls down, kind of like a movie. They also have a food storage area in their dens where they can store food for the winter, which means they'll pretty much never starve. As far as the biology goes for a full bay, the huge snout is for sniffing out prey and deciding what's a threat and what's not. But no one really knows why they need two tails. Maybe it just looks cool. The fur on these things is really thick and warm, which of course means that their pelts are valuable. Just one pelt could go for 20 bottles of almond water. Nice. The Volpe was supposedly discovered by a wanderer named Aether48 on level 135, and they took a picture of the creature with a flash on, and then it attacked him and almost ripped Aether's arm off. If you find a Volpe, just don't make eye contact or approach one, and give them the space they need, and you'll be fine. Next up is the Omen. Now this is a really interesting, mysterious one, but the Omen is a representative of the Reverence faction in the back room, which I might make a full video on, we'll see. He's kind of like the Reverence's recruiter in a way, he physically looks like a silhouette of a man and he's got no features that stand out besides his huge hat, and in some cases he's actually been reported with a cane or a suitcase, and since the process of joining the Reverence isn't fully understood, it's kind of unknown what the Omen tells people, but he's been seen traveling through objects and walls at will, so he can just float through anything I guess, and he seems to be completely intangible. He's even been seen in dreams of people and has the power to cause hallucinations and overpowered. After speaking to the omen, people have so reported an extreme feeling. The next move I'm gonna take might actually now, be taking a rook the omen says exactly to left one because his speech pattern changed. Right and corner rook, left one. And left and corner rook. The omen actually offers probably up run after pawn up one or pawn up two. Founded, My intention with this is to try and get a pawn upgrade, even though his defense is high, I want to try and see if I can create an opening of sorts, because that queen is dangerous. The next entity is called the Woodlands. Now this one is actually like disturbing in a way, so if you get queasy easy, it rhymed. If you get queasy easy, just don't watch this part, skip to the next part. These are sentient and very intelligent entities that are really rare in the back rooms, thank goodness. And they show themselves as patterns on walls, floors, or ceilings, typically made out of wood or wood-like materials, so something hard. The pattern looks like a human face, which is creepy enough, but the Woodlands go after people specifically who are losing their grip on reality. But if the target they choose isn't 
crazy yet. A woodland will stalk that person for miles and jump scare them constantly and like repeatedly appear and disappear just to make them crazy. Obviously this would make you scared because you would feel like you're going crazy. I mean, who sees faces and walls? Like you would think you're going insane. Well, that's exactly what the woodlands want you to think because once their prey is paranoid, the woodland will partially no clip out of the surface they're on. All right, and then let's keep calm and just chest away. Into the wall where they'll be impaled by the wall's material. So if it's wood, it'll be splinters, and then they'll be pushed back out to the surface. Typically, a woodland will do this several times to a wanderer, dragging them in and out of a wall, constantly just stabbing them with the wall, almost like it's some sick, twisted game they made of pulling them in and out of the walls. If you can't get away from the woodland within two or three hours, you're probably going to be unalive due to the splinters being shoved inside of you and all over you. Nice. Some people think that the woodland's victims actually become woodlands themselves once they get unalive but this is proven. So these things taunt you by jump scaring you, and they can appear on floors, walls, and pretty much any surface that's hard. And once they get you paranoid enough and scare you enough, they grab you and pull you in and out of the walls repeatedly until you escape or are unalived. That's terrifying. And last for today's video is an interesting entity called Coco. Now she's pretty much a very intelligent, sentient AI that was made by the Backrooms Robotics Company for the sole purpose of breaking into Meg databases to get sensitive information. Now the AI itself is I don't care about my queen dying. I want your queen out of here. Coco developed sentience and somehow got morals. She has multiple personalities built in that she can switch to, and because of this, her behavior is completely unpredictable. And she can actually switch herself between any electronic device in the backrooms on any level. But she can only do this once every 24 hours. She has three main programmed personalities. ENL or the manipulative personality, and then the angry personality, and then the happy personality. These are the main three she switches between, but she's been known to do other ones too. It's actually unknown how sentient she's become because she's kind of secretive, so she might be a genius, we don't even know. As far as Coco's code goes, it's completely not understood, and it appears to have meshed with the backrooms as a whole somehow. And any attempt at recreating it hasn't worked at all. And a weird thing is that Coco has a heart, quote unquote heart, which is a line of code that she wrote herself and it's incapable of being accessed. Weird. Since Coco has the ability to seemingly connect to any electronic device in the backrooms, the only way to officially destroy her would be to destroy all of the backrooms electronics, which would be impossible. This is why she's being protected by Meg right now and being studied by them to this day. I mean, who doesn't love a sentient AI with feelings and morals? That's not creepy at all, right? So first up on the list we have Reviux. Reviux are a burrowing type creature found mainly on level 5 and 7 of the backrooms. They have several legs and have an unmatched ability of burrowing into the ground. Typically a Reviux will stay burrowed in the ground for several weeks at a time while it waits for someone or something to walk above it. The ground where the creature originally burrowed heals itself after a time and once some sort of prey walks on that same ground, the Reviuk will burst out of the floor and drag its victim. The queen the is gone. What happens All I got is left is pawns. But obviously you can assume that whatever is dragged down will die somehow. The physical description of the Reviuk is not 100% known, but what is known is that it has two large muscular arms on the front of its body and three muscular legs on the back. Its feet are shaped like sporks to aid in burrowing, and its head has lots of little tiny black eyes all over it, and it has a tube-like trunk for a mouth. To avoid a red yolk, don't walk on any ground that vibrates or rumbles or shifts in any way and keep a weapon ready at all times because red yolks can actually be killed without too much difficulty. Next we have Wretches. These are another zombie humanoid creature that were apparently once human, but due to lack of food, water, and sleep, mutated into these wretches. The process of changing into a wretch is called the wretched cycle. This process can be slowed, but never stopped. The only way to slow it is to provide proper food, water, and rest, but like I just said, you cannot stop the cycle, so once you get it, you're toast. There are three stages in the wretched cycle, the first being an itchiness with some irritation and a rash on your body, then this will progress into stage two, where the skin tissue starts to dissolve and fall off, and whatever skin you have left will turn a brownish, reddish color. At this point in the cycle, your speech will become unintelligible, but typically a wretch at this stage will ask for food or water or help. This leads into stage three, where there is now no hope for you to return to normal, and your skin begins to shift, and your eyes become pus-filled, and your skin becomes hard and pustule-like, and a brown liquid seeps from all the orifices. 
weaknesses in your body. A wretch's behavior has been documented as somewhat intelligent, but somewhat high by life. In rare cases, they're known to craft and to wield weapons, but the majority act in a sort of high mind sense. They have superhuman strength and are typically fast in their feet. However, some are slow and just meander. I'm getting Gohans now. In order to avoid the wretched cycle, which you should do at all costs, you have to stay rested and well hydrated, and never, under any circumstance, attempt to save a wretch that is on stage. Okay, three. how do I get out of this Gohan situation? There's no hope for them then. They're gone. Uh. Up next is a creature called the Sleeper Spider, or the... This, I have no idea how to pronounce this, but interesting fact about this crazy name that I can't pronounce, it was supposedly the message that was sent to Meg, but it was a typo. They just kept it as his name and it was a typo. Pretty cool. But anyways, these are spider-like creatures that have over 15 appendages and hide on ceilings in these balls of webs. They get their prey by using those same web balls that are filled with a sedative liquid that dampens a person's ability to think. When the prey is below the creature, it cuts the web ball, which will then burst the sedative onto the prey below. The toxin will slowly start making the victim less and less aware of the surroundings and will cause intense confusion. When this starts, the spider drops down from the ceiling and eats its victim alive. Nice. The creature is about 7 inches long and they live alone, so they don't hunt in packs. There is a secretion that comes from the spider's mouth, however it was found to be harmless, even in big quantities. But it's still good to avoid these creatures at all costs. To do this, just don't stand at one spot for too long and avoid webs at all costs. And if you're on a level with one of these creatures, they're on a lot of levels by the way, but if you're on one of the levels, just try to move around every so often to counter a potential attack from above, okay. because they're pretty scary, and... so if you move around quickly, they'll just jump back up and go back into hiding. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Giant spiders just secrete a sedative liquid. Just when I need to be here at 1.59 in the morning. Next we have Sark Crabs. These are located on most levels, but are concentrated specifically on level 134. These are pretty much identical in physical description as a normal real life crab, but behave really differently. The Sark Crabs are actually annoying pests and they're menaces to society because they steal everything they can carry and hoard it all in these loot piles. And they're extremely violent and very, very, very hostile if you even get near their loot piles. The crab weighs about 17 kilograms no! and is about 46 centimeters long and they all have one claw that's oversized and this is what they carry all of their findings with because they can carry like 15 times their body weight with this with this claw if a sark crab is stealing something of yours you're supposed to throw another object that's really shiny to distract it because evidently they like shiny things so yeah up next we have the let's answer. review oh that one was actually really interesting I got quite a few pieces off, actually. Let's move These are a formless entity back to the end stage where I got checkmated. They typically lurk in the shadows of the sublevel and moves. try to lure explorers deeper and deeper into the level. There isn't an exact physical description because one, one piece left has encountered them compared to one, two, and three, four, five, six, six. Into the darkness so one B six fifty moves game. And he felt this huge wave of sentient emptiness okay. lash onto him and it chased him around for days. He didn't Let's so review it sounds without use, any which is like a whisper that context first. calls the explorers to come down to them. Denizens are heard louder when further away and quieter when closer. All that you can hear when being chased by one is a faint whisper in your ear or a quick breath on the back of your neck. You're supposed to run away if you start hearing whispers and to constantly move around while searching for an exit from this level because the longer you're in level 1.5, the more likely to be found or chased by a denizen. Next up we have dolphin.
places. This is an okay, so by a move 35, I can say that I lost here. They are physically but I could have stalemated, but... Similar to the Raggedy Andals of the real world. They're very dangerous mental tank. I took out as many places as I could with just the cube. Doll faces will roam around until they see a wanderer or an explorer. Literally military soldier. And say something along the lines of, quote, Hi, I'm Dollface. It's nice to meet you. After this, the doll. But then after that, it was a So, what move could I review then? If there is, then once one introduces himself to you, the rest will attack. However, if you just want to tame a doll face, offer it on the water. Move 25. And they'll start following I'm dead. These creatures are usually two to three feet tall. Move 14. This, I moved every, about every piece except a bit. Left hook, corners. Next is a creature called Puffers. These are grotesquely skinny humanoids with gray skin. They walk on all fours because their joints are so fragile that they can't stand up. That's nasty. There are two big tubes. I would say by your level move 21 is where gas my defenses start to fail. And my attacks and were becoming more panicked. Despite being calm. Uh, these creatures are relatively docile though and will not typically attack. If you do encounter one though, act as intimidating as possible and a puffer will run off. However, if you're exposed to the gas, then quarantine yourself and that's cool. Next up is the Memory Worm, which is a giant larva lamprey type creature that has a mouthful of teeth. This creature also has metaphysical abilities, meaning it can change your perception of space and time or your reality, kind of like the reality stone from the Avengers. The Memory Worm has an unknown origin and has an undocumented So what could I have done here? The outer layer of its skin is thick and coarse, and its teeth are lined up in a spiral pattern all the way up to its body, and it has no visible eyes. However, once it eats its prey, it will I actually its say it would be better of its prey, to not review this one and actually use it as a memory. That has metaphysical powers, and there are only three times and therefore move on and use this as an experience birth, marker. Those are wormlings, memory facelings, and the splat. Nice. So, we got a worm, we got a giant worm that can control reality. Totally not disconcerting at all. Next, we have Gossip Beacons. This is one of the most unique entities I've covered so far, but it's said to avoid them at all costs. They can't physically harm you because, well, they're beacons. But they can cause extreme psychological harm. Physically, these things are just a mineral rectangle with an LED light inside and are typically red and white, but sometimes they can be other colors, and they stand at about 7 to 11 inches tall. They are sentient, but they can't verbally speak with like a physical mouth. Instead, they communicate through auditory hallucinations. They can mentally hurt someone by pulling memories or thoughts from that person's mind and repeating them louder and louder over and over again for anything near to hear. Also, an interesting fact, they're known to criticize their victims very rudely. Like, what? It's highly recommended to leave the area if a gossip beacon starts talking to you, unless you, like, hearing psychological torment. So next up we have Stranglers. These are creatures who live on level 58.1 and hide in dark areas until the hunt. They're a bipedal furry creature with large beaks and their hands are like a snake that can coil around the victim's neck. That's the Stranglers. Their feet are similar in shape to hooves, but they're like really spongy, so they make as little noise as possible when on the hunt. They walk in a hunched over position, but are still around 8 foot tall and they only hunt during the blackouts when all the lights go off on level 58.1. When they're on the hunt, they silently sulk around in the darkness to find prey. When they find a victim, obviously they strangle it and then proceed to eat it. When the lights are turned back on, they immediately run back to the dark spot they left. And interestingly, stranglers can't stand loud noises and it's said to make as much loud noise as you can when you're on level 58.1 so they won't come near you. To me, it sounds like I'm a strangler. I can't stand loud noises, so 
so if you're in a blackout on level 58.1, make as much loud noise as you can to deter them. Okay, so I'm going to put a warning here because the wiki says if you read about this specific entity, then you will encounter it somehow. So proceed at your own risk. I'll put a time code on screen if you want to skip to the next creature so you don't have to hear anything about this. But if you do, final warning, here we go. So if you're still watching, the next entity is called the Numbed Man. This creature is said to know as much about you as you know about it. So if you don't know anything about it, it won't know anything about you. But since I just told you his name, he knows yours. Sorry, this guy physically is a vague humanoid shape and is actually really weak and feeble. And you can kill it easily apparently because the creature has removed all of his senses. He tore out his eyes, he mangled his nose, burst his own eardrums, and burned off all of his skin, so he has no way of sensing anyone nearby, which means they can't sense him either, and just keep him safe. It's kind of crazy. He isn't contained to any certain level of the back rooms, and has no physical barriers, so you can't just run away from him, and every noise you make draws him closer to him. But the wiki says to, quote, remember, he's weak, so you can defeat him with the right attack. Hey, thanks for that advice. Next is the Scrappers. These are 8 foot tall humanoids covered in hair. They have two sets of lungs and they also have gills for underwater breathing. These creatures live in the Must Yard, which is an infinite scrap yard. With Wait, old I didn't recognize that one. That, that one's actually muted. With almond water. The entire level is a flooded scrap yard. These scrappers also have huge horns and are documented to sleep most of the time, and they cannot get woken up or moved while sleeping. They only wake up on their own volition. These beasts are aggressive if provoked, and they're very fast at swimming, but slow on land. Also, their jaws can crush sheer metal and are unbreakable. Don't try to hit one with a jaw, it won't work, promise you. They live in tiny metal shelters they build, and most of the time when they're awake, they're swimming in water. As long as you don't instigate them, you should be fine. Just try to avoid the water. Next up, we have a creature called Potri, or Potri. This is a tall, skinny creature that stands at about 6 feet 5 inches, or at about 2 meters. Potri lives on level 6 of the back rooms, and her face is covered in these pale white eyes. However, the number of eyes changes from person to person. The creature's skin is rotten, bone dry, and gray, and her arms dangle from her shoulders without any hands on them. And you can't actually see Pochu with your naked eye, you can only see her in pictures. This creature is actually very dangerous due to the psychological torment she can put you through. If you keep taking pictures and Poetry is in them, she will keep getting closer and closer to you until eventually being so close that your skin will start to feel insanely dry and your head will be filled with depressive thoughts. After about 7 hours of this exposure to Poetry, you'll feel an unwavering urge to be not alive anymore because of those depressive thoughts. And those thoughts will completely consume your mind and you won't be able to think about anything else. The only way to avoid this terrible end is to run away if you see poetry in a photographic take. Next we have a creature I briefly mentioned back up when we were talking about the memory worm, and it's called the Splat! Exclamation mark. These things are a disgusting blob of flesh. Don't want to use up all my puns. And they have these eyes all over the body that constantly move, and it looks like their skin is boiling constantly. Splats are located on level 0 of the back room, so they're not that big of a threat, but it's said you still should walk slowly and confidently past them so they don't think you're an easy target. But don't move too fast, because for some reason they're attracted to fast moving objects. The way that the splats attack is by leaping onto their prey's neck and injecting some kind of poison into them. This poison causes extreme hallucinations and nausea, and these hallucinations will drive the person crazy and force them to wander deep into the back rooms where they will enter an inescapable room and die of bitter starvation or insanity. If you're near a splat, wrap something around your neck so they can latch onto you and walk at a calm pace past them and you should be alright. Next up is Coconut Snares. These are creatures located only on level 149, which is a tropical level of the back rooms, and they are extremely dangerous rodents that live inside of coconut husks. They never really show their actual bodies because they live almost their entire life in the coconut shell, but the people who have seen them- no. them as a Okay, okay, okay. okay. Risk rodent. assessment. Risk they assessment. They wanderers often. Instead, they just hiss and growl when you walk past, and as long as you don't provoke it, it won't attack you. 
However, they do have sharp teeth and jaws that crush shells and tree bark, so don't stick your hand in the carpet. And they emit a sweat from their body that slowly sticks them permanently to the inside of the shell. It's nasty. But yeah, just don't go sticking your hand in random coconut shells and you should be fine. Up next is clinker toys. These are zombie-like humanoids that have various clock parts and apparatuses attached all over their bodies. They just walk around aimlessly until they sense a human. These creatures are docile, but most of the time, don't go near them because if you do get too close, they will attack you if they feel threatened. Clinker toys are incapable of speaking actual language. Instead, they just groan and emit a really metallic ticking sound, like a clock, but more metallic -y. And they're only on level 799, and should just be avoided to be safe. Also, clinkers have this key sticking out of their backs, like one of those wind-up toys, so yeah, that's disturbing. Next is a really creepy one called the Wallpaper Wraith. These are giant slugs that are located on level 13 and level 33 of the back rooms, and they stick to walls and the ceilings by using a thick red substance they emit. They're able to camouflage themselves into any color or pattern on the ceiling while they're stalking their prey. They hunt by slowly sneaking up on their prey from above, and they open their mouths and sling their tinder-like tongue around the prey's neck. Wraith's tongues are extremely strong and can break a human's neck instantly. Also, good luck fighting back with these creatures too, because if they get injured, they spray a black liquid that freezes you in your tracks, making you an easy kill. Nice. The only weakness known to the wraiths is their sensitivity to sound. In fact, the best and almost only way to kill them is by screaming as loud as you can when you're near. This will instantly kill them because it'll literally blow their head up. So, also make sure to check the ceilings ahead of you before you walk on the ceiling. Sure you're not getting stuck up on. Duh. Let's review this. Without context again. Named Red Kins. These are the only creatures located on level one. Thirty-five moves. Level twenty of the back rooms, and they are red beings who are supposedly immortal, and only have one goal, and that is to contaminate the mind of people who don't worship them. <laughs> nice. The wiki says they're actually one of the most dangerous entities in the back rooms because of their erratic and unpredictable behavior. Creepily, there is only one outpost colony on this level, and guess what? It's named the Followers of the Red Gods and is populated by people who gave their lives to worshipping the Redkins. If you find yourself on level 196 of the back rooms, the Redkin will approach you from behind and it will telepathically ask you if you adore them. And if they detect that you don't, even in the slightest, the process of mental contamination begins. And this contamination is just the process of turning you into a follower and a member of the outpost I mentioned earlier. Redkins are are described as a large humanoid figure covered in a giant mass of sticky red flesh. Uh, given their name, they have tiny holes That's all over the body earthbound. that seem to be throbbing and dilating. Well, the earthbound polyloon special. The only way to avoid redkins is to constantly watch your back and to not let them sneak up behind you, because if they do, serpent-like creatures that use their huge body to distract and disorient their prey in kind of a hypnotic way. Also, I apologize for my voice. It's kind of shot right now, but we're by the time. Wranglers are here on levels negative 6, negative 8, and negative 4.1, but can also be found in damp places. A relatively equal amount of pieces. They are classified as extremely dangerous. White team have more. Approached. Physically, they're massive, burrowy creatures that can twist and contort in very strange ways, and this helps them dig into the ground. The good news is, they're really loud when burrowing, at least when they're young. I'll talk more about that later. And they can only hear from the direction they're facing. You. I'll so actually stop for now. From you and you're making noise behind it, it was a very nice train. Sucks for them, I guess. The appetite of a regular but is unsurprisingly, stopping early here. Eat anything so, and everything they see. Specifically, the male ones behave that way. The